the Scotland export? Whiskey, fish, oil and gas might come to mind in modern times, but one of Scotland's biggest exports has always been its people, including around 2 million in the 1800s and another 2 million in the 20th century, to destinations all over the world. The story of the Scottish diaspora has been well told in print, but very rarely made publicly available in the participants' own words, until now. Testimonies of Transition is a brand new audio book in which Scots who have emigrated in the last century tell their stories of overseas settlement and sojourning in their own words. Clips from many hundred hours of interviews are woven into a thematic narrative that explores why and how the emigrants left home, the trials and tribulations and joys of the transition to new worlds, the way in which they made their mark and imprinted their identity on the places where they settled or sojourned, and their experiences of returning to Scotland. I hope you enjoy listening to their stories. Here are short clips from interviews with six Scottish emigrants who each went to a different corner of the world. Morag Bennett was 10 when she left Benbecula for Alberta with her parents and siblings in April 1923. Morag remembered the excitement of the transatlantic crossing on the Canadian Pacific liner, the Marla. Agnes McGilvery from Whithorn was 100 years old when she recalled the glamour of New York City in the 1930s. Murdo McIver, who settled in Vancouver in 1953, remembered fondly a childhood on the west coast of Lewis, during which his horizons were expanded to almost every part of the globe by listening spellbound to emigrants who had returned to their homeland to visit or settle. Helen Campbell described a culinary faux pas inadvertently committed soon after she arrived in New Zealand's South Island in 1965. Brian Stewart, who had spent most of his childhood in rural Zimbabwe, then southern Rhodesia, was bewildered by his first encounter as a 15-year-old with an escalator and an anorak when he returned with his parents to live in Marisha. And Ina MacDonald told of the heart-wrenching and persistent homesickness that in the 1960s brought her back from Australia to the family croft in North Uist after only four years. Oh, I remember quite a bit about the voyage, the icebergs, and it was foggy and we had to anchor. We, it took us about, oh my goodness, close to two weeks to cross. We were stuck in the fog and icebergs were huge. Oh, I remember the blasting of the floghorn, for sure, I can still hear it. And of course, we were put in the staterooms, you know, to sleep and that, and uh, we never had running water in Rinbecula, as you know, it was just a well, and we didn't know what the bowl and the taps and all this sort of things were, you know. I went there and then I sent my brother the address right away and he wrote back and said, what are you playing at? This is the fourth address you've had in two years. Why are you not staying in your jobs? But that was me. One had to stay on duty until 10 o'clock and you could do as you like after that because you got your key. Well, I went to more musicals and more theatre and more everything. <laughs> it was a great place to grow up. Everybody knew one another and Old House was the centre of the village and there was Cayleys there every night from Monday to Saturday, never on a Sunday. And I heard all the stories from Canada, Australia, South America, Falkland, South Africa. So the stories were fantastic. And I think that's maybe why I'm here today in Canada. The first 
first thing that really struck me was um, I went to do shopping, the messages, and I asked for margarine. And that was an absolute no-no in those days. I thought I could get stork margarine. And uh, for baking, because I had never baked with butter. And they just, they nearly ran me out of the shop. That, I, I really remember that, yeah. I mean, you couldn't, even two, three years after that, you couldn't buy margarine unless you had a doctor's line for it. I do remember behaving almost exactly as Paul Hogan behaves in the film of Crocodile <laughs> when confronted for the first time by an escalator. The other thing was, and I bought an anorak. I'd never seen an anorak. Um, and the idea that I was going to have to wear this strange piece of kit in order to put up with the Scottish climate was, was a, bit, a bit daunting. Oh, another thing I remember too when I was over there, uh, that song was really on the top. There was a soldier, a Scottish soldier, Andrew Stewart was. Oh, every time I turned on the radio, that was on, and I used to sit and I would cry. Oh, it was just magic. I can remember going to a, a Scottish ball, and uh, this couple we went around with a few times, he was also, he was homesick, more homesick than his wife. I think they both came from Glasgow. And I remember us all holding hands and Will you know come back again? I'll be back. I'll be back. He was even <laughs> homesickness. Oh, I was just miserable. Oh, I was just wishing I was back. You know, I didn't want to go.